on World News Tonight. Spy Alert. What is a suspected Chinese spy balloon doing above the US? More details on this tonight. Doubling aid. EU pledges to double the military aid program for Ukraine while sanctioning Russia. Uphill battle. ECB and Bank of England fight inflation at the risk of a global recession lingering ever closer. And legacy of Stalingrad. The ever patriotic Russians celebrate the 80th anniversary of the Battle of Stalingrad by lighting up the sky. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening and you are watching World News this Friday night. Lined up tonight are updates on the political arena, military tensions and severed relations across the globe. Leading tonight is the US striking a suspected Chinese high-altitude surveillance balloon over the continental United States, a discovery that risks adding further strain to tense US-China relations. This comes just as Secretary of State Antony Blinken is set to meet with Chinese President Xi Jinping next week. The U.S. says it's monitoring a suspected Chinese surveillance balloon spotted above Montana. If confirmed, it would be a brazen act just days ahead of a planned trip to Beijing by U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken. This video, captured in the city of Billings, showed what appeared to be the suspected spy balloon. Officials said fighter jets were mobilized to potentially shoot it out of the sky. The Pentagon advised President Joe Biden against doing so, for fear debris could pose a safety threat. It said the balloon was travelling at an altitude well above commercial air traffic and did not present a military or physical threat to people on the ground. The incident may highlight the lengths to which Beijing and Washington have been willing to go to spy on each other amid rising tensions between the superpowers. Blinken is expected to travel to China next week for a visit agreed to in November by Biden and Chinese President Xi Jinping. It was not clear how the discovery of the spy balloon might affect those plans. John Paracini is a senior international defense researcher at the think tank RAND. It's not clear that it is going to see anything more of the United States that the Chinese satellites already see. So the timing is unusual and in many respects unfortunate. Uh, President Biden has talked about keeping lines of communication open to the Chinese government. And Secretary Blinken's trip to the People's Republic of China in the coming days was part of that effort. So this creates a complication uh, for both the United States and China to discuss, and it's an unfortunate uh, provocation. Republican House Speaker Kevin McCarthy took to Twitter to voice outrage. China's brazen disregard for U.S. sovereignty is a destabilizing action that must be addressed, he tweeted. President Joe Biden cannot be silent. McCarthy said he would request a Gang of Eight meeting, which is a classified national security briefing for leaders on both sides of the political divide. Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson Mao Ning said Beijing was verifying the situation and warned against speculation and hype. Meanwhile, the Philippines has granted the U.S. more access to its military bases. The defense's chief has said that amid mounting concerns over China's increasing assertiveness in the disputed South China Sea and tension over self-rule Taiwan. The U.S. and the Philippines on Thursday announced American forces will gain access to four new military bases in the Pacific Island nation, expanding a staging ground as Washington seeks to counter China in the region. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin in Manila met his Philippine counterpart and hailed the agreement as a significant security measure. We discussed concrete actions to address destabilizing activities in the waters surrounding the Philippines, including the West Philippine Sea. And we remain committed to strengthening our mutual capacities to resist armed attack. It comes amid mounting concern over China's increasing assertiveness in the disputed South China Sea and tensions over self-ruled Taiwan. A spokesperson for China's foreign ministry on Thursday countered that America was to blame for rising tensions in the region and said American access to Philippine bases, quote, hurts regional peace and stability. America has been flexing its Pacific military might. Last month, American F-18 Hornets roared off the deck of the USS Nimitz as the aircraft carrier navigated through the South China Seas. 
Austin's visit to the Philippines follows a trip to key ally South Korea. This week, American and South Korean forces staged joint military drills featuring heavy bombers and stealth fighters. Those drills provoked a furious condemnation from Pyongyang. Now, Seoul and Washington have conducted their first combined air training of this year. It involved advanced U.S. assets deployed to the peninsula amid Pyongyang's growing nuclear threats. North Korea responded with yet another threat, this time verbally. This joint U.S.-South Korea military drill has prompted a scathing attack from North Korea. After the B-1B heavy bombers and stealth fighters flew exercises, Pyongyang's foreign ministry said in state media Thursday that such drills had pushed the situation to an extreme red line. It also said that the North was not interested in dialogue as long as Washington pursues hostile policies. The White House has hit back at the accusation, saying that the US has no such intent towards North Korea. The spat comes hot off the heels of Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin's trip to Seoul during which he vowed to expand military drills and deploy more strategic assets there, such as aircraft carriers and long-range bombers. North Korea's statement cited Austin's trip as a cause for concern, saying, quote, This is a vivid expression of the U.S. dangerous scenario, which will result in turning the Korean peninsula into a huge war arsenal and a more critical war zone. More than 28,500 American troops are based in South Korea as a legacy of the 1950 to 1953 Korean War, which ended in an armistice rather than a peace treaty. Last year, North Korea conducted a record number of ballistic missile tests. It was also observed reopening its shuttered nuclear weapons test site. There was a heated debate in the U.S. Congress before the GOP-led House voted to remove Democratic Congresswoman Ilhan Omar from the Foreign Affairs Committee, citing her past comments condemned as anti-Semitic. House Republicans ousted Democratic Congresswoman Ilhan Omar from the Foreign Affairs Committee on Thursday over remarks that were widely condemned as anti-Semitic. Words matter. Rhetoric matters. It leads to harm. The Congresswoman is being held accountable for her words and her actions. Omar's removal from the high-profile committee comes two years after Democrats removed Republicans Marjorie Taylor Greene and Paul Gosar from their committee assignments after incendiary remarks and a tweet that showed Gosar appearing to kill Democratic Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. The deeply divided House voted 218 to 211 along party lines to remove Omar from the committee, with Republicans citing remarks for which she later apologized, including a 2019 tweet that suggested Israel's supporters in U.S. politics were motivated by money, not principle. Republican House Speaker Kevin McCarthy said Omar's ouster from the committee was not revenge. We're not removing her from other committees. We just do not believe when it comes to foreign affairs, especially the responsibility of that position around the world with the comments that you make. She shouldn't serve there. But this is what the clear. This, if it was tit for tat, we would have picked people, took them off all committees and said nothing about it. Omar of Minnesota, who arrived in the United States as a refugee from Somalia, is the only African-born member of Congress and one of the few Muslim women in the House. In defiant remarks on the House floor, Omar vowed that she would not be silenced. I will continue to speak up for families around the world who are seeking justice. Whether they are displaced in refugee camps or they are hiding under their beds, somewhere like I was, waiting for the bullets to stop. Because this child survivor of war would have wanted that. And my leadership and voice will not be diminished if I am not on this committee for one term. My voice will get louder and stronger and my leadership will be celebrated around the world as it has been. McCarthy also rejected assignments of Democrats Adam Schiff and Eric Swalwell to the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. Both played major roles in the impeachments of Republican former President Donald Trump.
Many brutal phases of winter are taking aim at the northeast in the U.S., which could be some of the region's coldest weather in decades. The south is still suffering from icy and deadly weather that crippled travel and took down power lines. After a wild week of spin-outs, slides and slips, the paralyzing ice is starting to thaw. Go, go, go. But the south isn't out of the woods just yet. I spun around six or seven times. If it wasn't for that curve, I'd be completely off the bridge. The freezing rain and thunder sleet dissipating today. But havoc remains in its wake. Man, we slid on some black ice and almost got into a bad accident. We were stuck in the ditch. Four days of icy roads have claimed at least eight lives across Arkansas and Texas. And this close call in Oklahoma. Police dash cam capturing a big rig swerving across lanes on I-40. While in Fort Worth, a jackknife truck crushing this police SUV, sending two officers to a hospital. At home, people struggled to keep their footing. Definitely scary. I can tell you that. It's very slippery out here. More than 400,000 customers are still without power across the south, with Texas' hardest hit. The most vulnerable turning to warming shelters. The skies are clearing, but not in time for the more than 700 flights canceled nationwide today. 500 alone in and out of Dallas-Fort Worth. And although happier days may be on the horizon, a chilling prediction from Pennsylvania's most famous mammal meteorologist. Six more weeks of this wintry mess may be yet to come. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now moving on to the never-ending war between Russia and Ukraine. The EU has promised more assistance for Ukraine while preparing for a tenth round of sanctions on Russia. With the Russian invasion of Ukraine nearing its one-year anniversary, the EU is continuing its military support for Ukraine. After holding talks with Ukraine, the EU Council announced Thursday that it plans to provide additional military aid to Ukraine to the tune of 500 million euros or 545.5 million US dollars through the European Peace Fund. EU member states also announced that they will contribute an additional 49.1 million US dollars to train Ukrainian soldiers. The decision was made to provide technical education and special training to accelerate the deployment of the German-made Leopard 2 tanks. In addition, the EU has also promised over $27 million to help clear landmines threatening the Ukrainian people. Meanwhile, European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen, during her fourth trip to Ukraine since the outbreak of the war, announced further sanctions against Russia over its aggression. She said that the 10th package of sanctions issued by the European bloc will be implemented on February 24th, exactly one year on from the outbreak of the Ukraine war. She added that in addition to the sanctions, Russia needs to be held accountable for its war crimes against Ukraine, with a dedicated center set to be established in The Hague to do just that. Russia must be held accountable in courts for its odious crimes. Prosecutors from Ukraine and the European Union are already working together. We are collecting evidence. And as a first step, I'm pleased to announce that an international center for the prosecution of the crime of aggression in Ukraine will be set up in The Hague. Von der Leyen is set to hold talks with Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky and EU Council President Charles Michel on Friday, where the three sides will announce additional support measures and cooperation plans, including tariff-free benefits for Ukrainian exports and cooperation in the renewable energy sector. And while Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky urged EU leaders to impose further sanctions on Russia, Russian President Vladimir Putin evoked the spirit of the Soviet army that defeated Nazi German forces at the Battle of Stalingrad 80 years ago to declare that Russia would defeat Ukraine. Russian President Vladimir Putin evoked a famous World War II victory over Nazis to rally his nation over the nearly year-long invasion of Ukraine while officials in Kiev warned of an ominous new attack. Speaking in Volgograd, formerly known as Stalingrad, where the Soviet army defeated Nazi forces in a pivotal battle 80 years ago, Putin lambasted Germany for helping to arm Ukraine and said again that he was ready to draw on Russia's entire arsenal, which includes nuclear weapons. 
Those who are betting they will defeat Russia on the battlefield clearly don't understand that modern war with Russia will be quite different for them. We don't send our tanks to their borders, but we have the means to respond. And it won't end with the use of armored vehicles. As Putin celebrated, rescue workers in Ukraine Thursday tended to civilians wounded when a Russian missile destroyed apartments in Kramatorsk, killing at least three people and trapping others under rubble, according to police. Moscow has routinely denied targeting civilians. The European Central Bank raised interest rates by 0.5 percent and explicitly signaled at least one more hike of the same magnitude next month, reaffirming it would stay the course in the fight against high inflation. Rates rose again in the Eurozone and UK on Thursday. The European Central Bank lifted its benchmark by another half a percentage point, as widely expected. That took it to 2.5 percent and continues a record streak of hikes. Bank President Christine Lagarde said high inflation left no choice. Headline inflation has gone down, and more so than we had expected, and that many had expected. But underlying inflation pressure is there. Lagarde is now under pressure to spell out when rate hikes will slow. That after the U.S. Federal Reserve this week eased back on the pace of its increases. On Thursday, Lagarde penciled in at least one more rise. In view of the underlying inflation pressures, we intend to raise interest rates by another 50 basis points at our next monetary policy meeting in March. There was a similar story over in London, where the Bank of England did its 10th hike in a row. It too did a half percentage point increase, lifting the benchmark rate to 4%. But Governor Andrew Bailey did offer hope on inflation, after data showed it edging back from recent peaks. We have, we have seen a turning of the corner, but it's very early days and the risks are very large. The comments prompted investors to dial down bets on further aggressive rate hikes. Some of the world's biggest tech companies missed Wall Street expectations this time. Apple had its first profit miss since 2016, and Google parent Alphabet's ad business slipped, as well as Amazon warning of a disappointing outlook to come. It was a bleak earnings day for some of the world's biggest tech companies. In results reported on Thursday, Apple missed profits expectations for the first time since 2016. Sales fell 5% to $117 billion down in every part of the world last quarter. Part of the problem? Weak iPhone sales. COVID lockdowns in China disrupted production. Demand fell in China too. And overall, iPhone sales are down around 8% compared to the year before. Shares in the tech giant fell 5% after the results came out. It was a slightly rosier picture at Amazon. Its holiday revenue beat expectations, with early holiday shopping sales helping to a point. Still, the boost may be short-lived. Amazon is already warning it may not make any profit at all this quarter. It doesn't think layoffs will do enough to blunt the impact of consumer clampdowns on spending. Facing high inflation and an uncertain economy, CEO Andy Jassy wants to slash costs. It's a similar story at Google parent Alphabet, where Chief Executive Sundar Pichai said the company was on a journey to re-engineer its cost structure. Both echoed comments from Meta boss Mark Zuckerberg the day before, who placed emphasis on cost efficiencies. Alphabet also fell short of profit and revenue expectations. Overall, Alphabet's net income fell to $13.62 billion from $20.64 billion a year earlier. Shares there were down about 4% in after-hours trading. The stock lost about 40% of its value last year. Alphabet has also announced plans to slash 12,000 jobs, or about 6% of its overall workforce. Apple is one of the few large tech firms that hasn't announced big layoffs so far. Welcome back. And for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. 
Former South Korean Justice Minister Cho Kuk was sentenced to two years in prison for using his influence to receive academic favors, including university admissions for his children. The ruling comes nearly three years after the scandal first surfaced, which served as the biggest setback for the previous Moon Jae-in administration. Mohammad Eslami, head of the Atomic Energy Organization of Iran, emphasized that Iran will use nuclear energy peacefully, refuting the accusations made by Western countries. The IAEA Director General Rafael Grossi accused Iran of making covert changes to one of its uranium enrichment clusters and said Iran did not declare it. A child was killed and another was seriously injured after they were hit by a train along the railway line in the western German town of Recklinghausen. Emergency personnel were called to the scene near a former freight yard at 1800 local time. Police searched the tracks with flashlights and drones. Security camera footage shows the vehicle smoking as it was grounded in the middle of Las Vegas Boulevard and Siegfried and Roy Driver. The police officer pulled the driver clear from the vehicle moments before it went up in flames. The driver was taken to hospital but is expected to make a full recovery. Mexico's Popocatapelt's volcano spewed ash and gases, leaving people from a town in its shadow under alert. A local authority councillor, Camilo Vasquez, said in case the people had to evacuate their houses, the local government would need support from other authorities to move them out. And that is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again on Monday as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you miss any of the stories tonight, you can always watch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. Now we leave you tonight with fireworks illuminating the sky behind the motherland called statue in Volgograd, formerly Stalingrad. Russia culminating a day of commemorations to mark the 80th anniversary of the defeat of Nazi German forces by the Soviet army. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.